My name is Jake, welcome to the channel. In today's video, we're gonna do another Review My Pie video where I review subscriber portfolios. This is one of my favorite series on the channel. Honestly, I love looking and seeing how other people all across the globe are investing in a dividend growth strategy. And it's really cool to see how different people react and how different people view this topic. And I just always get so excited when I read your emails and you know hear you know some of the things that you're thinking about, some of the things that you're doing. and. I just absolutely love it. So if you are a long-term subscriber of the channel, you've been following along on this fire journey that my wife and I are on, we actually just sold our second house here on Friday. And so we we had a couple rental properties and we've slowly been selling them. And what we're planning on doing is transitioning from physical real estate into our dividend growth portfolio. So you know that it provides a little bit more flexibility in terms of you know, where, where we can be and what we can do. But yeah, I'll be giving an update over these next couple of weeks over what we're doing with that money. Um, we had a really, you know, just really good timing investing in real estate before the pandemic. We've now sold two houses and I'm gonna be sharing here in the next couple of videos what we're doing with that money and how we intend to leverage real estate in the future and all of that fun stuff that comes with being financially independent and living off of a dividend growth portfolio. So in today's Review My Pie, we're gonna look at a subscriber question here from a 16 year old here in the United States. I'm gonna, I thought the question was really interesting and I thought there's a lot of people out there that may be in a similar situation. So we're gonna answer that question here on the video. Then we're gonna review the first portfolio from a 26 year old here in the US, the second, an individual from the Philippines, and the third, a 20 year old from the United States. And if you're not familiar with where the Philippines is, I am right here in Texas. You scroll over here and you can see here in Asia, the Philippines. I have actually never been to the Philippines. Somewhere that I actually, I wanna go down the road is I definitely wanna make it out to Bali. I've been to China. I've, I've been to China for almost a month. I, I did a whole tour. It was a really, really interesting experience. I've been to New Zealand, but I definitely want to go to like Fiji, Australia, really interesting in Australia, assuming it's not burning. Um, I'd love to go to Japan, the outskirts of Japan. I'm not so, so interested in Tokyo. I'm not a big city guy, um, but definitely the, uh, the rural areas of, of Japan would be really interesting for me. Malaysia, maybe. Um, Middle East is a little bit tricky. South Africa, I've always wanted to go on a safari. Uh, that's something that I've always wanted to do. I almost did it while I was living in Germany. Up here above Johannesburg, I think there's a famous safari location. I wanted to go and definitely do that. But yeah, so I've also been to Egypt. I've been here to Hugarda, Hugarda, exactly. Went snorkeling there while I was living in Europe and I've been all over Europe. But yeah, anyways, don't want to get too sidetracked. This is where the Philippines is. And as always, the timestamps will be in the description below and the portfolio links will be in the description as well. As always, everybody, I'm not a financial advisor. Don't take what I'm saying as financial advice. It's just merely for your entertainment. And as always, everybody, I don't review the portfolios in advance, so I'm reviewing them for the very first time as I'm recording the video, trying to make it as genuine and authentic as I possibly can. But yeah, I mean, this week has been really, really exciting. We sold the house, work has been going well, my wife is doing well. Uh, our, our friend here, Julia from the Ukraine, is in Poland now. She is safe. It's been a pretty good week despite all of the uh, the chaos that's going on in the world. Um, speaking of chaos, we have a little 11-month-old baby. But for whatever reason, he always likes to touch things that he's not supposed to. And there's always these, these times where we're just like shaking our head like, why does he do certain things? And, you know, you kind of run into situations a little like this. Oh, you see this guy? See this guy? Number one bullshit guy. He do the wee woo wee woo because he have to go in front of the traffic. Look what I do. 22 and he do wee woo wee woo. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh man, the little turd. All right, the first question is from Anju. 
Uh, she writes here, hello, Jake. I have only recently discovered your YouTube channel and you've won me over as a, as a subscriber. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, your videos are easy to understand, although the next day I'm confused, so I have to rewatch them. Uh, if you have, uh, you have me quite determined to go the dividend route. Okay, well, very cool. I'm asking for your guidance. I know you're not a financial advisor and I won't hold you responsible in any way. Well, that's nice of you. Uh, anyways, I am late to the investing game. I'm trying to invest, to make sense of this. I'm 62 and looking to invest about $50,000. What would be your recommendation in today's market? And what kind of split would you suggest? Obviously, I want to keep it simple, being a newbie, but still diversifying a bit. VYM, SCHD, and any, uh, any, any other that I can add to these, I would appreciate any advice you may have. Okay, so I'm sure that there's a ton of individuals out there that are in your, maybe your late 50s or your early 60s or your late 60s. What you have to understand when you're investing in a dividend growth strategy is you have to understand your time horizon. You have to understand when you plan on living off of the, the dividend. So the key thing is when you invest into a company, Companies can either be a growth or a value company. And when you look at the total return of your investment, it can be broken up either just in the share price, right? That, you know, the, a stock goes from $10 to $20, right? If it doesn't pay a dividend, that is your total return. If a company does pay a dividend, then that dividend is part of the total return. So maybe it goes up from 10 to maybe $17, but you get a, a three three percent dividend on an annual basis, right? So the key thing here is when you're thinking about this is when do you plan on living off of the dividend? So somebody that's in their 60s is gonna have a much shorter time horizon than maybe somebody that, that is in their 20s that has maybe 30 or 40 years of compounding, right? Where they're going to reinvest the dividend. Now, if you're 62, you're probably planning on living off of the dividend very soon. So what you want is you want a higher starting yield, but it doesn't necessarily, you still want that growth, but you want to skew heavier towards a higher starting yield, right? And so if you understand compounding rates, right, and we've talked about this a little bit on the channel, is depending on your time horizon, you want to kind of find a compound rate that is going to meet your specific scenario, your specific needs. And so if you're 62 years old, you definitely wanna skew, in my opinion, if you plan on living off the dividend in the short term, going for an investment vehicle, you know, that being like an ETF, for example, uh, that has a higher starting yield. VYM and SCHD are really great ETFs. These are some of the best ETFs out there. I personally think that any investor regardless of your age, could hold these ETFs. But the weighting, I guess, is really the question of how you want to weight these, right? And so there's other things that you could look at if you are looking to live off your dividend and maybe you want to diversify a little bit. Maybe you could have 25% in VYM, maybe 25% in SCHD. They, they're similar, but they're also very different. There is over overlap in these two ETFs. There is. But not enough to make it where I say, oh, hey, you should do one or the other. I think having both is fine. I personally own both. But what you could also consider is you could look at holding maybe a total U.S. market ETF like VTI. You look, you could look at the S&P 500 ETF if you want to diversify that way. Um, you could also look at cover call ETFs. I am actually a fan of cover call ETFs. Not all of them are, are created equal, but one that I personally really like is JEPI. J-E-P-I is it tracks the S&P 500 and it's writing call options on this uh, against the index and it's paying you out a dividend on a monthly basis. So that's something that you could definitely take a look at. So for me personally, with the market today, you know, the way that the market has kind of been pulling back, you could even look at a NASDAQ cover call ETF. One that's very popular is QYLD. If you're looking to live off the dividend in the short term, QYLD could actually make a lot of sense. But keep in mind, like bear in mind that if you have a longer time horizon, these cover call ETFs are not always the best option for you. So really, this is specific to an individual that is in their 60s. So that's personally how why we do it. I like how that you say here, you want to keep it simple and you're a newbie. $50,000. I would not try to over engineer it. I would try to keep it simple. I would pick one, two, maybe three ETFs 
and keep it very, very simple. My personal favorite ETF is SCHD. Um, if you wanted to have SCHD, VYM, and then JEPI, I think that that could make a lot of sense. But the key thing here, regardless of the investment, the key thing that you have to understand is what is your time horizon and what is your goal with the investment? Do you plan on living off of the dividend in the short term or the long term? Because that's what dictates how you should be looking at this. So if you if you are a newbie and you want to keep it simple, I would pick one, two or three ETFs. Stick with that. And, you know, you can't time the market. Maybe you invest a little bit in today. You invest a little bit in next month, however you feel comfortable. But that's how I personally would view this. If you're going to approach this as a do-it-yourself investor and you have $50,000 today that you want to look to invest and you have a time horizon of an individual that's 60 years old, that's kind of how I personally would approach it. So I hope that that helps. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, Andrew, just shoot me over an email. I'd be happy to, uh, to respond. Thank you so much for the question. All right, the first portfolio is from Kiernan. He writes, hey, just uh, wanna say I'm a huge fan of your channel. I've rewatched the Review My Pie series almost five times and just to get the idea of how to best approach my portfolio from scratch and hope you are, you'll be impressed with my submission. Well, hey, thank you so much for the kind words. I, I appreciate it. I'm 26 years old, I'm from the United States and will be starting my career as a federal civil a civilian employee for the Navy, great. Uh, the starting and potential pay as my career advances are fantastic. I don't have much debt and I'm pretty a pretty frugal guy. So my goal as it stands is to contribute 25 to 30% of my paycheck to an IRA account. That is great. While having a solid stock performance is nice, my primary goal as it relates to this portfolio is sustainable yet fast dividend growth in order to take advantage of compound interest with my time horizon being 25 to 30 years that will eventually become passive income, hence never selling the stock along the way. You're 26 years old. I really wish that I understood everything that you're talking about here. I wish that I was doing this at 26. This is so, so incredible. In general, I managed to get a five-year dividend growth rate around 13%, played around with the allocation on Simply Safe dividends, and a pretty good return, uh, return rate that in hindsight is pretty close to market performance. Uh, consider the following criteria when reviewing my portfolio. First, no REITs or foreign companies, only companies with qualified dividends for the favorable tax treatment. This is really, really important, especially if this is in a taxable account. If it's in a Roth IRA, the REITs don't necessarily matter. So that's, that's important to understand. Um, but it says that you were investing in a Roth IRA above. So is this a Roth or is this an individual? Uh, let's see here. Stocks must have an economic moat on their respective industry brand recognition and or consistent dividend history. Wow, not a single stock is more than 5% of the overall portfolio. Dude, this is amazing. This is so, so great. You have the building blocks. You have the foundation to set yourself up for sex success. Over the next 25 to 30 years, dude, you're gonna be a multi-millionaire. This is incredible. I, I think this is just, uh, I, I really, really like what you're, that you're putting together a plan, you're putting together assumptions of how you're gonna build out your portfolio, you're looking at the dividend growth rate, you're looking at you know, the economic moat piece of it, the respect of, um, you know, the industry, the brand recognition, the consistency in the dividend history, the track record, this is really, really great. The first point here, no REITs or foreign companies, only companies with a qualified dividend. If this is an IRA, you're, you're not gonna be paying taxes anyways, so really you could actually have REITs in there if you wanted. Now, you don't specify if it's a Roth or an individual. I personally, if you have 25 to 30 years, in my personal opinion, I kind of like the Roth IRA a bit better. Unless you, you know, later down the road, you change your mind, you or depending on your, your income and your tax bracket. But me personally, I kind of like a Roth IRA a bit better. Um, but that's just, just my personal opinion. Everyone's got a different, in a different situation, but, um, with the no reads, I, I think you don't have to necessarily stress this as much if this is in a tax sheltered account, if this is in a taxable account, you're hundred percent correct. So let's take a look at your portfolio. You're up 144% over the last five years. You have a good healthy dividend. It's not too, too low. It's not too high for your time horizon of 25 to 30 years. I think anything around 
one to one and a half percent is a good starting dividend yield. Once you start getting into the 2% range, that means your compound rates are probably a little bit lower. Um, and that's why I, I think, you know, having this at a one and a half percent makes a lot of sense. I shared an entire video on this in the past when it comes like, you know, different investing for different time horizons. So that makes sense. Uh, 36 holdings. I think that's a manageable amount. Let's see what you got in here. You got technology at the highest consumer discretionary. I like that. You have staples down here. That's good. Healthcare, good. Industrials, good. Finance, okay. Materials, materials and communication. Okay. Um, you have the you have the breakdown or the sector allocation correct. Obviously, it's going to depend on what you have in the individual slices. But the overall slices in terms of the weighting over growth, you know, when looking at growth rates over time, these are the higher growing or you know faster growing. So I think this is good. Uh, you got Microsoft at twenty, Apple at twenty, Visa, Mastercard, Texas Instruments, and Intel. Yeah, I think. I like the fact that you have here, let me pull up my fancy dancy calculator here. What was this? This was 24 and 20. What do you got in here? Uh, times 20 times 24. So yeah, you got less than 5%. Good. So yeah, I do like, I do like that you don't have over 5% in one individual company. I think that's really important. Even though these are some of the best companies in the world, I still like having that kind of as a, as a baseline rule or guideline. Uh, these companies are fine. They're very different. I mean, Texas Instruments and Intel are very different than Microsoft and Apple. The only thing that I think is going to be interesting over the next, you know, 25, 30 years is blockchain. I don't know how blockchain is going to disrupt Visa and MasterCard. Right now, they're the kings, right? There's, they're obviously in the pole position, but I don't know how blockchain is going to affect payment processing in the future. I think that these companies will have to adopt some form of a blockchain strategy. Otherwise, they risk the, they're at risk of, of being disrupted. But I, I think there's, I think these companies are going to take advantage of that, you know, take, take advantage of the blockchain before that ever, ever happens. That's just my opinion, though, obviously. Uh, let's see here. You got Lowe's, Nike, Home Depot, Starbucks, and McDonald's. I think these are great. Every single one of these are great. You could add maybe a, a target in here, but as it stands, these are absolutely amazing companies. Healthcare, United Healthcare, Medtronics, Johnson & Johnson, Avvi. Um, I'm not as familiar with ZTS, but with these ones, I think these are good. You you did send me another follow-up question with the taxes for Medtronics. Um, because it is a company in Ireland, I believe Ireland has... Uh, has something in place where there's favorable tax treatment for U.S. citizens. It's the same thing as the U.K. You don't pay any international tax on companies, regular companies that are in the U.K. However, you will pay an international tax if it's a if it's a REIT, if it's a U.K. REIT. So definitely read up on on the tax impl implications of international investments. That's one of the reasons why I don't invest in a Nestle. Right. Nestle, I would love to invest in a Nestle, but the tax treatment is just it just sucks away at your total return when you have to pay an international tax to Switzerland. It's just kind of how things are. So, um, for example, if I were to be faced with, OK, do I invest into Hershey's or do I invest in a Nestle as a U.S. citizen? I would me personally, I would always invest in a Hershey's because you're not subject to the international tax of Switzerland. And I think it's like 15%. Don't quote me on the percentage. I haven't looked at it in a while. It's either 15 or 20% uh, international tax for her, for Nestle. Uh, let's take a look at your industrials. Waste management, love it. Union Pacific, love it. Lockheed Martin, you're probably feeling really good right now with Lockheed Martin and Caterpillar. Yeah, these are all really, really great companies. Um, I like Honeywell as well as well. There's there's a few others, but these are all really, really great companies. I like it how you have it evenly uh, distributed there. Uh, finance, SPGI, great, great company. T Row, great. This is this is a powerhouse dividend growth company. T Row is just unbelievably strong. It's crazy. Uh, JP Morgan, great. Aflac, also really great, really strong insurance company. Um, BlackRock, yeah, it's a it's a it's a really it's a it's a great company as well. Um, SPGI. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think this would be really nitpicky. Do you really need this to be the highest 
or do you want to have it evenly distributed among the others? Personal, personal preference, I don't think you can go wrong either way. Having this one the highest or evenly distributed in it doesn't necessarily matter in my opinion. Uh, consumers, Costco, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, good. You got Coca-Cola and Procter & Gamble at the lowest. I like that. You got Pepsi and Costco higher. I also like that a lot. I like this. Uh, utilities, next year Energy, American Waterworks, great. They're both 50-50, some of the best companies out there. As you get closer to retirement, what you could consider doing is you could add like a Southern company or a Duke Energy down the road as you get closer to retirement. But for the next you know, 20 or so years, as your dollar cost average into this portfolio, it's great. Uh, communications, Disney, great. Comcast, great. Verizon, yeah, yeah, it's good. Um, I like that you have Verizon a little bit lower given your time horizon. I think it's good. Materials, Sherwin-Williams and APD, great, great. Um, there's a few others that I like out there. I like PPG as well. Um, but yeah, these are these are really great. So Dude, you this is this is really really great. The thing that I like about your portfolio is you're well diversified. You're considering international tax. You're in, you're considering uh, qualified and non-qualified tax treatment. Though if this isn't a tax sheltered account, that doesn't really matter. But you know this would be a portfolio that I would feel comfortable holding in a taxable account, right? And having this just in a pure tax. Uh, not a tax advantage account and just dollar cost averaging into this. And the cool thing about this, you mentioned 25 to 30 years. My wife and I have shared this a couple of times. We originally planned with a 10 year time horizon. When we invested into real estate, we cut our retirement date by about four or five years right? We cut it nearly in half. So there's going to be things that happen over the course of the next 20 plus years that things are going to change. You're going to be in a different, you know, things happen in life, right? You might get married, you might have kids, you might win the lottery, you might get a promotion, you might, who knows what happens. Um, this portfolio, I think, is one that you can dollar cost average into and sleep very well at night. This is not a portfolio that you have to obsess over every single day. You could invest into this portfolio literally and review it once a year. Isn't that amazing? Even though you have only individual companies, the companies that you have in here, the, this is a very stress-free way to invest if you're going to invest into individual holdings. This is a great portfolio for a 26-year-old with a long-term time horizon. Great job. Thank you so much for sending over your portfolio. All right, the next portfolio is from Marky. He writes, hi, my name is Marky from the Philippines and I'm a new subscriber to the channel. I've been watching your Review My Pi series and I just recently entered uh, investing into the US market and have been curious to which companies people have added to their portfolio. I'm bearing the brunt of the recent sell-offs, but I'm still positive for the, for the future as my time horizon is still quite long. As I'm new to investing here, I'm currently at this stage where I want to buy every company I know. This plus the personal research I've been doing has caused the number of my holdings to balloon up. I've been entering positions just to gain exposure to certain sectors. I am starting to worry I'm over diversifying again. Yeah, you don't want to buy everything. There's a lot of great companies out there. I, I faced the exact same thing as you when I first started. My goal with my portfolio is just to ensure that I, I will be comfortable when I eventually decide to retire, whether early or not. I'm quite aggressive with my money as I've been dabbling with my local stock market and other Asian markets since I started working professionally and four years ago with cryptocurrency. We don't have M1 Finance here, but the concept of having pies really sounds great. So I tried to make my own version in Google Sheets. I work in the analytics field, so I quite enjoy working on spreadsheets. My broker allows uh, fractional investing, so I get to uh, follow the allocation I set on the file whenever I add to my holdings. I rebalance my portfolio at least quarterly. I am open to mixing things up and adding or removing from my portfolio. Hope to hear your thoughts. Well, Mark, thank you so much for sending over your portfolio. Um, the first thing that catches my eye, when you say you rebalance your portfolio quarterly, it, are you talking about the traditional rebalancing of selling and buying? If you're rebalancing in the traditional sense where you're selling your overweight and buying into your underweight holdings, that is going to be incredibly tax inefficient. Um, you're going to have to pay a ton of taxes 
if you're doing that. So that's the very first thing. If anybody is thinking about rebalancing with a dividend growth strategy, what I would say to you is really, really reconsider that. Every single time you rebalance and you sell out of your, your holdings and then rebuy into something else, you're, you're causing a taxable event. And that is something that you don't want. Unless this is in a tax sheltered account, then it doesn't matter. You can do that all you want. But if it is in a taxable account, you want to be very careful about rebalancing. Really, really important. That's the main thing that I would say here is really make sure that you understand how you're rebalancing your portfolio and what that means for, for your, you know, your taxes. All right, let's take a look at your portfolio. I got to squint my eyes here. It's kind of small here on the screen. Um, all right, this is, you said that you liked spreadsheets. You weren't kidding, were you? What is this? This is so cool. Fire time left, 22 years and nine months and 11 days. Dude, I'm so disappointed. Why don't you have seconds? You're not even counting the seconds? What? <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is so cool. Positions 53, one market cap type of, I'm all over the place. I'm like, what am I even looking at? This is so cool. What is this? I, I'm sure that there's a ton of people watching this that would love to, to have access to this. Um, if you're watching this video, Mark, um, comment in the comment below and let me know if you want to you want me to be able to share this spreadsheet with everybody watching. This is incredible. What is this? Oh my gosh. And you got multiple tabs over here. Like I've seen some spreadsheets. This is spreadsheets like on cocaine. Like what is this? What? This is so cool. Okay. So I could play around in this for like hours. Let me see here. So you got, you got it here by sector. You don't have one sector over 25%, that's what I'm looking at. Technology at 17. Index funds, you even incorporated index funds in this. I really, really like that. Uh, you got energy at 2%, financials at 3.7. I'm sure you're, you're the type of person that would correct me if I said you have consumers at 10, you'd be the person that say, no, correction, Jake, I have it at 10.4%, right? With your pinky, up, your little pinky up in the air. Um, no, this is so cool. Uh, and you have all the individual holdings in here. You got Apple, Adobe, Amazon, Alibaba, Coinbase. So half of these are probably down like 30% this year, but that's okay. You got what, 22 years, nine months and 11 days. I'm sure that you'll have time for these to bounce back up. <laughs> Oh my gosh. You got Meta, aka Facebook, Alphabet, Johnson & Johnson, McDonald's, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble, PayPal, C, Shopify, Block. Oh man, dude, some of these are down like 50%. Tesla, Taiwan, United Healthcare. So um, yeah, you got Mega Cap. What is this over here? You have it over here as well. Dude, I am certain there's gonna be like dozens, hundreds of people watching this video that want access to this spreadsheet. Please comment in the comments below if I can share this with the, uh, maybe I can make a copy of it so it doesn't have your personal data or your data in here and I can share it with, uh, with everybody. This is so cool. And you even have a color coded, man. Oh my gosh. So you got your VOO, so you, you got VTI. Um, the thing that I like about this is you do have a mixture of growth and value. You know your time horizon, 22 years, nine months, and 11 days. And uh, you have a mixture of growth and value in here. Um, and you have the, uh, the allocation as well. So I'm assuming this is your target allocation, right? How much do you have in the what is this? Two? So you have 30% in, in the US, and then you have international, you have VIG, you have VWO. Okay, okay, okay. I don't know how taxes work in the Philippines um, when it comes to international tax. I think there is actually favorable tax treatment for you in the Philippines if you invest in the US companies. I think that is the case. What do you got here in this other table? You got the ticker, sum of percentage, really nerdy stuff. What else you got in here? Sum of percentage. This is equal 100%. It equals 50%. Does this equal the other 50%? I have no idea. Um, okay, cool. Well, um, what other nerdy things can we do with this? You can filter it by sector. You can filter it by industry. You can filter it by type. 
cool, cool. All right, awesome. So I guess my final thoughts here is, what is, this thing keeps, I keep looking at this, this invest, is this like moving? It is totally moving. Look how cool this is. It's moving, wow. Um, class distribution, you have stocks and ETFs. Okay, so 50% is in individual companies, 50% is into ETFs, 83.2% uh, 83 .2, 83 .2 is in the US, China, Singapore, and Taiwan, very nice. Um, one thing that you could consider is, if you do want to get international exposure and you want to keep it simple, I actually really like VXUS. I invest into this ETF in my Roth IRA. Um, if you want to keep it super, super simple and just have one ETF for the whole global market, there is an ETF. It's called VT from Vanguard. It invests in the entire global market. Um, and so you could have one ETF and get international exposure uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty convenient. So VT is one that you could check. So essentially, what what you would get is you got VT VTI, and then you got VXUS, and then you have VWO emerging. Right. Essentially, with VT, you get VTI, VWO, and v, VXUS all in one. Right. So you can get to get those three ETFs with one ETF, which is pretty cool. Um, okay. Well, cool. So. Mark, I, I think this is amazing. I think it is so cool that you're viewing dividend investing the same way that I am, a guy here in Austin, Texas, looking at investing and trying to reach fire through my dividend growth portfolio. It's so cool to see that there's like-minded investors all the way over there in the Philippines uh, and uh, that are, are nerding out on this topic as well. Thank you so much. I think your portfolio is awesome. I think you, you know, I'm sure you've you're kind of feeling the pain with a few of these tech growth stocks, um, but over the next 22 years, nine months and 11 days, I'm sure that you're gonna be you're gonna be fine. Thank you so much for sending over your portfolio. All right, the last portfolio is from Carter. He writes, hi Jake, my name is Carter. I'm a 22 year old college student living in Arizona. I began investing for FIRE about a year and a half ago. I have a 35 year time horizon. I'm investing about 60% of my income, 60%, damn. A little over $1,000 a month and will graduate without consumer or student debt. High five, my man, high five. I will. Uh, I have split my investments into a Roth IRA, which I am maxing out in an individual account focusing on dividend growth companies. Thank you for your time. I look forward to hearing your opinion on my portfolio. Well, Carter, man, this is so cool. I say this like every time. I wish that I would have stumbled upon dividend growth investing when I was 20, year, 20 years old. I just wish I would have been interested in the topic when I was younger. I, I think you are in such a, a huge advantage. Like I'm, I'm 35, 15 years. I just think back, oh man, if I would have done this 15 years ago, I I just can't even my I can't even fathom what what my life would look like had I done this much sooner. So one thing that I will say, you're 20 years old. Don't let finance, you know, investing in the fire community consume your entire life. That is one thing that I've learned very very quickly. You know, you're 20 years old. Make sure that you're finding time and budgeting to go travel, to go and do things that you like. I cannot stress that enough. I think uh, I had this conversation earlier to yesterday with my wife. You know, it's that old office quote, right? How, you know, how do you know if today is the good old days, right? You know, we always talk about the good old days. What if today is the good old days for you, right? You don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss today as if today's the good old days and look back on today and wish you would have done something different. So that's something that's really, really important that I've, I've been thinking about a lot. You don't want to just consume your life just with the fire movement because it can be very easy to do so. You get so excited about it and you do nothing else. Make sure that you're you're enjoying today as well. All right, let's take a look at your first portfolio. You got your Roth IRA here. For whatever reason, this chart is not working. I don't know why it doesn't like it, whatever. Um, you have a good healthy dividend yield. You could even get a lower dividend yield given your, your time horizon. 35 years, man, I can't even forecast what I'm gonna do next week, right? I can't even predict where I'm gonna be in a month from now. 35 years, really, honestly, you're 20 years old. Take that 35 year, 35 year time horizon with a grain of salt. There's so many things that could happen that are outside of your control. Um, just be flexible, right? Don't pigeonhole yourself. Don't force yourself to only think one-sided, like narrow-minded and only think that, okay, it has to be 35 years. You, you might, things might happen in your life that might switch that up. So 
With that long of a time horizon, let's take a look and see what kind of investments you have in here. You got VTI, SCHD, VYM, and you have Berkshire. Interesting, interesting. Okay, okay. Um, I I do actually, I, I like this. Um, I like it and I want to give you some, some feedback here. For 35 years, man, when you understand compound rates, these are really, really great dividend growth companies in these two ETFs. But I think you may be able to even get higher returns if you focus on ETFs that focus more on a growth model, a growth methodology. So for example, I like DGRO a little bit more than VYM for a longer time horizon. SCHD is kind of like a unicorn. It's one of the best of the best. But in my opinion, this is my honest opinion, I would not have SCHD and VYM in here at such high percentages. I would have VYM, if you're going to have VYM in a Roth IRA for 35 years, in my opinion, I would have these much lower and I would have a growth ETF. I would have, you know, the S&P 500. I'd have VOO. I'd have the technology ETF from Vanguard, VGT. And also the ETF that I have for my baby, for our baby boy, Lucas, you know, the wee woo, wee woo. <laughs> oh my gosh. The wee woo, wee woo. Um, we invest into SPYG. Let me see if I can show you what that is. Let's see here. Do, do, do. Let me show you what that is. SPYG. Ooh, this is a new, new, uh, new outlook for new uh, design for ETF.com. Interesting. Okay. Um, SPYG. All right. If I'm in your shoes, this is something that I'm thinking about. I would much rather have SPYG. You know, SPYG tracks an index of primarily large cap growth stocks. The index is selects, selects companies from the S&P 500 based on three growth factors, and you can see the growth factors here, what they're screening them for. It has an incredibly low expense ratio, great asset center management. It's been around for freaking 22 years, right? Like really a long, long time. Um, has 240 companies in here. So really, essentially what you're getting is you're getting the S&P 500, but you're only getting 240 of the, of the S&P 500. So it's skewed towards growth and not value, okay? And over the long term, long term, 35 years, I think you're gonna be in a really good spot. But the highest, you know, you look at these companies in here, you got Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, you know, you're gonna get these in the S&P 500 anyways, but the long tail, the long tail is this. This is what's also gonna be in your portfolio. Right. And so you're going to get higher growth companies in this ETF. So that's why that's something that I would definitely consider. If you're going to have these in here for 35 years, in my opinion, you're going to get higher compounding rates in a ETF that is focused a bit more on growth. And if you want to keep it pretty vanilla and pretty basic, you could put more into VTI. You could put more in VOO, for example. Um, but in my opinion, if I was 20, 20 years old, I would not do this. I would not do this. I would focus more on growth, and especially this is a Roth IRA, man. What you can do is you can invest higher in growth, and then in 30 years, this is what I personally would do. You do what you want, but what I would do is I would take all these growth ETFs that have tripled and quadrupled faster than SCHD and VYM, and then I would be buy VYM, and then I would buy SCHD, and I would pay zero capital gains tax on the sale of that. That's personally what I would do. Okay, let's take a look at real estate. Realty income, FRT, good, AMT, stag, EQR. Okay, so in my opinion, in my opinion, I, I am not the biggest fan of this. 35 years, who knows what's gonna happen to good, to realty income, EQR, stag. These are all amazing companies. I don't know where these companies are gonna be in 35 years. I don't think you do either. I don't think Warren Buffett knows. I don't think, you know, no one knows, right? And so in my opinion, I would much rather have an ETF, a, a real estate ETF like VNQ. You go back over here and take a look at this. 
V and Q, do, 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 do. V and Q, let's take a look at this. V and Q, what do you get in V and Q? Oh, look, you get American Tower, right? You get American Tower, you get Equinix. What do you have in here? You have, uh, you have, uh, you know, equity realty. I thought you had Equinix. You have realty income, you have American Tower. What else do you get in here? Uh, realty income, right? So you're already getting access to, you're getting the growth and you're getting exposure to realty income and American Tower with V and Q, but you don't take any risk. You take zero risk of what happens to this individual company over 35 years. So that's why, in my opinion, set this up and forget it, right? If you put only ETFs in here, I, I actually do like Berkshire. Berkshire is like an ETF itself. But um, that's why I personally do not invest into any individual companies in my Roth IRA because I set it up and I forget it. I have 20, like 25 years before I'll use my, my Roth IRA. I don't even want to think about it. I invest into VTI, VGT, VXUS, and VNQ, and that is it. And I just forget about it. So that's my opinion on your Roth IRA. Uh, take, take what you want from it. It's everybody's going to do, the, do their own thing, but that's the reason behind, you know, kind of my thought process around this. Fire, this is your taxable account. This is, wow, that is actually a really strong dividend and a really strong performance. Holy cow. What do you got in here? You got Tesla or something in here? Dang. Um, you got 31 holdings, tech, infrastructure, healthcare, and consumptives. Okay, so like consumers, I'm assuming. All right, let's see what you got in tech. Pick and shovel. You have a pick, what? What is, what? Pick and shovel, okay. Uh, all right, Texas Instruments and Intel. What the, I'm looking at this like, what? Uh, okay, innovators, what is innovators? He's got, the dude's got Tesla. All right, you got Tesla, you got Google, you got Microsoft and you got Apple. Okay, cool. Um, Tesla's not gonna pay a dividend in my lifetime, I don't believe. Google, I don't think they're gonna pay a dividend anytime soon. But that's okay, you can always repurpose these in 10, 20, 30, 35 years and then buy you know other, something else with it. Um, how is the waiting, 25? Yeah, the waiting is fine. Infrastructure, what do you got in infrastructure? You got utilities, telecom and energy. Strong, strong dividend, dude. Okay, so you're 20 years old. What? And if you don't ever plan on selling these, this is, in my opinion, not the right approach. You're causing a taxable event every time you receive a dividend. So you probably have heard people talk and trash on dividend investing. Oh, dividend investing is irrelevant. Dividend investing, it's the stupidest thing in the world. Like, the dividend haters are talking about what you are doing. The dividend haters are saying, why do you wanna pay taxes now? Why, why? And so the dividend haters are really pointing at you when they're talking about dividend investing. You don't want to pay a dividend, a high dividend like this for the next 35 years. This is not the right approach if you plan on reinvesting the dividend for the next 35 years. If you plan on living off the dividend here in the next maybe five or 10 years, yeah, I could see why you would do this. But this right here is causing a taxable event and you do not want this, okay? The dividend looks cool, right? But this is not, this is not optimized for tax efficiency given your time horizon. Utilities, oh, you got waste management, cool. Uh, EPD, APD, and you got American Waterworks. Okay, these are fine. Um, EPD is doing really, really well right now. Uh, these are fine, not really utilities in that sense, but I, I can understand why you think it's a utility. Uh, telecom, Verizon, and AT and T. Okay, I, I don't like I don't like this. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, unless you're holding this for the the spinoff of the Warner Warner Media, and you're going to take that. Um, I'm not a big fan of this. I like if you're going to go with media, I like Comcast. I like Disney. Um, I like Verizon, but much smaller percentage. Energy, Nexo Energy is great. Duke is great. Chevron, Exxon Mobil, I, yeah, they're fine. Like I personally, over the next 35 years, I would much rather invest in Nexo Energy and Duke. For right now, like you look at oil and you know how can you say anything bad about oil, right? But I'm thinking about this over a 35 year time horizon. Me personally, I don't care what oil is doing today or tomorrow. What is it gonna do in 35 years? 
right? And that's how I view investing is I don't care what if it's at an all-time high now or an all-time low right now. I'm thinking, where is it going to be a decade from now? And that's how I view investing. And that's why I, I'm always kind of skeptical and, and hard on, on oil stocks. So uh, something, yeah, let's see. Healthcare, what do you got in healthcare? You got Procter & Gamble, okay, Johnson & Johnson, Avi, Pfizer. Um, um, yes, no, no, no. Um, here's the problem. The same thing with the infrastructure, right? You look at this dividend yield, you're, you're getting, your dividend yield is too high. It's too high for your time horizon. Um, this dividend yield should be like one and a half percent, right? And so Procter & Gamble as a consumer, like this should be much lower. Abvi is good. Johnson & Johnson is fine. You could look at maybe other growth healthcare companies. These are all, most of these companies are, consumer healthcare companies. So they're ones that you understand as a 20 year old, you you're a consumer of them. So it's kind of hard to invest into a healthcare company, like a, a manufacturer, a, you know, medical supply company, right? How are you supposed to know what a medical supply company is? But those medical supply companies and those pharmaceuticals are growing faster than Procter and Gamble. I would look and see maybe what you could do. Let me help you out. Let me see what we can do. All right, let's take a look at VHT, for example. So VHT is the Vanguard Healthcare ETF. It has only healthcare companies in this ETF. It has a, a decent expense ratio. It's been around for over 15 years. It has it's a good asset center management, so it's not a, you know, a small ETF. But here, look at this. These are healthcare companies. United Healthcare, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, AbbVie, great. Thermo Fisher, Abbott, Eli, uh, Eli Lilly, Merck, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Medtronics, right? These are the healthcare companies that you wanna kind of screen for if you're going to invest in individual healthcare companies. Here's my opinion, you know, my, my thoughts for you. If you're 20 years old and you're investing in individual companies, you're building on a dividend portfolio, this is what I would say. Don't just try to pick the winners, right? Understand that you're not going to have all the all the answers. You're not going to be able to beat Mr. Market. My recommendation for anyone in this position is look at seeing if if you want to have specific exposure to an industry to a sector, consider a sector or an industry ETF. For example, you could add the VHT to your slice here, and you could make that the largest holding. And then you could say, okay, well, I also want to get exposure to J&J &J and AbbVie and Pfizer. Okay, well, maybe put 5%, 10%, 10%, and then maybe put 50% as an example in VHT. That is something that I would do with healthcare. That is the exact same thing that I would do with utilities. With telecom, you can maybe consider doing the same, et cetera, et cetera. It's hard to pick the winners as a consumer. Right. And so if you're 20, 20 years old, you also don't want that added pressure of the feeling that you have to pick all the winners. So that's why I'm such a firm believer of high quality ETFs. Right. So that's my 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 thoughts there. Uh, what do you have here? Your uh, consumers, you got defensive and discretionary. Uh, pretty high dividend yield defensive. Walmart, Walgreens, Kroger, Pepsi, Kimberly Clark, James Schmucker. Um, and Altria. Okay. Um, what about Costco? Do you have, what, what do you have in discretionary? You don't have Costco. Um, so I would maybe check out Costco, check out Costco. Kimberly Clark is, it's a great company. I own Kimberly Clark, but the difference is, is I plan on living off of the dividend from Kimberly Clark next year, the year after. Whereas you plan on living off the dividend for the next 30, in the next 35 years. Therefore, it doesn't make sense. The time horizon here doesn't make sense. So something to definitely consider. You're on the right track with thinking about high quality dividend companies. But what you don't, what you don't seem to understand is the, uh, the tax impl implication as well as the dividend growth rate, right? For your time horizon. Let's look at your discretionary, the Disney, Starbucks. This one I actually like. I like this. This is my favorite slice 
in your whole portfolio. This is my favorite slice. Um, it's got annihilated, but it's my favorite slice. Uh, for the next 35 years, Disney, Starbucks, McDonald's, Home Depot are growing much faster than J.M. Schmucker, Kimberly Clark, for example. All right, let me help you out here. Um, let me see if I can find this video for you and see if this will help. All right, if you go to my channel and you go under, uh, under videos, take a look at this video right here. It's called the Dividend Starter Pack, how to invest based off of your time horizon. I made this video here last year. This video will help you understand investing based off of your time horizon. And I think this is gonna shed a lot more light and help you understand how to invest with a 35 year time horizon. Carter, thank you so much for sending over your portfolio. There's just a few things that I would tweak with your, your Roth IRA and with your individual account. But once again, thank you so much for sending over your portfolio. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I hope that you learned something new. I hope that you got value out of today's video. And I'll catch everybody in next week's video. You know what? I think we're going to be friends. Can everyone say hi to my friend? That's crazy. I just wanted to say thanks. I'm glad you came along, partner.